be, maybe some others. Um, so I want to do two things today. I want to do the operator product expansion, and I want to do the background field method. So these are both good techniques. The operator product expansion. Hi right, guys, come on in. Good. So operator product expansion is is really effective field theory. It's so it fits in here very nicely. It's it's a good example of of this Wilsonian thinking that I talked about. I'm only going to do part of it. I'm not going to do the whole story here. I'm going to do the effective field theory part. And then there's other technology that comes along with it that I'll do in the standard model section. Uh, just because it's, it's a different story. The, but the, here's, here's So the operator product expansion. I'm going to. It's done. The typical example, the the best example to, to work on, is in the weak interactions. So in the in the standard model, the coupling between the Ws and quarks is on a two square root two W mu dotted into V U D U bar gamma mu one plus gamma five D plus V U S U bar gamma mu one plus gamma five S plus that you know there's there's a bottom quark one also, etc. <coughs> so there are others. But then if you if you're looking at how at the product of these, we would form uh, an interaction, typically you call it the Hamiltonian, the weak Hamiltonian is g squared over 2 m over 8 mw squared. I'll put a minus mw squared up here just because I want this normalized, right? Um, integral d3x. There should be two v's here, vud, vus, one starred, d4x. I have the, the propagator, the Feynman propagator of x, mw, and then I have the time ordered product of two currents, j mu, ud, of x times j mu uh, u s is staggered um, at zero. So those, those two currents are so the product of those two currents. Okay, and the thing that everyone would do, the first thing everyone would do, is so if that constant defined as g fermi over square root of two is just take the usual delta function appro approximation for the um, propagator and write this as g fermi over square root of 2 times j mu of 0, j mu of 0, you know, again, u d u s. That's that's a naive thing to do. Wilson tells us to do better. And so Wilson tells us that we should write this as well we can so there's V V there. We can factor out the G F V V or two. He'd write it as the sum over operators N or I C I of well, it's actually of MW over lambda times local operators. Okay. And it's the transition that we're after. You know, technically, the operator product expansion would be time ordered. J of X 
j of 0 is sum over i ci of x oi of 0. That's, that's how you often see it written. But here we do the, the integration over the w propagator, and, and it turns into a function of mw and lambda. Okay. So the, the goal is to see what goes into that and what is, how to interpret it. Uh, so we can see that to, to lowest order, to we would take um, O, let's call it O1 is J mu of zero, J mu of zero, again, with labels. And C1 is one, okay? But that's not the interesting one. The interesting one is, is going beyond it. Actually, as an aside, let's do the aside now. There's, is, that's actually not completely true. We always do that. But there's another operator, even at lowest order. There's a, it's called a dimension four operator. And that, that operator is it's d bar d slash one plus gamma five f. So let's call it O. I don't know. O. O x. I don't know. I don't have a good name for it. Okay. And wh where does that come from? Well, even at lowest order, there's, this is lowest order in QCD, there's the following diagram. I take an S quark, turns into an up quark, turns into a D quark, and there's a W emitted there. Looks like a self-energy piece, right? Um, if you write out what that is, let's forget about the masses for here. This is the integral D4K, 2 pi to the fourth. 1 over k squared minus mw squared, gamma mu 1 plus gamma 5, k slash plus p, so here's k there, here's k plus p, p slash over k plus p squared, squared, gamma mu 1 plus gamma 5. Okay, there's some, there's some factors of g squared out in front there. Everyone see why, why, how I wrote out the diagram? That, that's comfortable now? Good. Okay. Well, gamma, 1 plus gamma 5 is work out just perfectly fine. You just pull it right through one, one gamma matrix to another. Each time you go through a gamma matrix, 1 plus turns into, 1 plus gamma 5 turns into 1 minus gamma 5, because gamma 5 is anti-commute. But if you go through two of them, it comes back to one plus. So that just that squared the, ga the gamma mu gamma mu's um, uh, just there's an identity minus two times this, right, so th they disappear. And then this integral here, there here's a p slash, and the k slash when you do this integral turns into some number times the p slash also. So this thing turns into some number times p slash. So 1 plus gamma 5, sorry, I have a 1 plus gamma 5 still. So that's, w then the operator that's appropriate to that is, is then the, uh, that would be equivalent to an operator O bar, it would be d slash 1 plus gamma 5. S. But since this is a gauge invariant, it has to turn into d bar capital covariant derivative 1 plus gamma 5 S. Okay? So, there's actually, that's actually also a very interesting 
development there. It's not completely obvious that this would work out. But this tells you that if, if I go do the calculation, so just gauge invariance, if I go off and do this calculation, let's draw the diagram up here, at W, let's put a gamma out there. A gamma or a gluon either, or a gluon. and D, that I have to get exactly the same number times E. Okay. Because this diagram plus that diagram have to come together in that combination. Okay. So gauge invariance will tell you that it has to work. And you can sort of see how it's going to happen. It's going to—it's one of these Ward identities. It's just like the Ward identity in QED, that the self-energy and the vertex correction carry the same number, and so they—it's like like z1 equals to z2. These these guys will have exactly the same number sitting in front of there, okay? And it works out. It does. Okay, so there is a second operator in the operator product expansion that it's never mentioned. And what goes wrong? What, what, why, why don't you include it? Okay, well, you would think that this guy could do, do some damage, that we could imagine doing S to D gluon or S to D D gamma. And so let's, if we tried calculating it, let me just tell you what the answer is. If you try calculating it, there's, there's some vertex here. Here's the operator S to D, Pho let's call it photon. And there are a couple other things you could do too. Also, there's I could emit the photon on the S line initially, then then have that vertex with D slash sitting there, or I could have the the vertex. Um, I could have this vertex first, S to D, and then emit the photon there. And if you calculate those, you get zero. Okay. It's also true if I just made the operator uh, d, d bar s. Take that operator. Um, and th in that case, you don't have this diagram. You just have these two. You get zero. So if you're looking for a little calculation exercise just to do a little extra homework. I know Max is always looking for more homework. Do these calculations and, and just watch it happen. Okay. But it almost seems like a miracle. So what? You know, maybe there's some other diagram with lots of lots of other stuff around. You know, three extra gluons, or you, know, you radiate more photons or more gluons that wouldn't cancel. But the answer is no. The answer there's a theorem. Uh, the it does it, it never contributes to nothing. No, does does not contribute to anything. Okay, and it goes by the name of Feynman, Feinberg Kabir Weinberg. And, it's a, and, the, and the proof is sort of interesting. The proof is that you can diagnose this away. You can remove it by diagonalization. All right. What a how are you spell it? Okay. And here, here's the idea: is that that we have the Lagrangian. The usual Lagrangian has that. S bar, I D slash S, 
plus d bar i d slash d plus this thing which is a um, d bar i d slash s and there's the Hermitian conjugate also a star uh, s bar i d slash d I didn't work that one out because that takes a d quark in the initial stage to an s quark in the final state okay so this forms a little matrix you know s s bar d bar one one a a star s d and by changing your field names by rotating your fields you can get this the matrix into so that this matrix turns into one plus a one over one minus a you know you that's sort of the easy diagonalization with ones on the diagonal and then you rescale you know d or s goes to one over the square root of one plus a f you renormalize and it, it then turns it into the usual operator okay and so if you can do this if you can diagonalize it then it's sort of a version of Hogg's theorem okay that by renaming your fields you get the same physics out and so the physics of this with the operator present and the physics of it after renaming the fields is the same after renaming the fields there's obviously no interaction there's, because there's, everything's diagonal there's no strangeness changing so there isn't before either so all the things that happened before have to vanish okay it, it's tech sorry. so it's like it's like it's a version of Hogg's theorem and it's also true that it's like Hogg's theorem it's only on shell matrix elements that vanish if you took those guys off shell they don't vanish but for the decay they're on shell okay so any questions about that that's it's it's very cute I think okay so now let's go back to the OPE so to the the OPE two order alpha strong so we've got we've got blue ones around I'm going to restrict myself to a certain set of diagrams for the start here um, the type of corrections that you might put in are these so here's this is an s quark going to u quark uh, a u quark going to a d quark that's what the currents do but the usual one here's a w exchanged and you of course could flip that one of that upper quarks into the final state if you want so you do diagrams like this diagrams like that diagrams like this diagrams like g w diagrams like and there's one more of course like that so there's there's a set of diagrams that we normalize that operator okay um diagrams a and b don't contribute okay and again it's the word identity so I you know I'm not doing the calculation in great detail but but it comes from if you if I add the wave function renormalization um, minus one half to the fourth power so that's z2 and then I have z1 well I, sh I should just think it's on each vertex 
gamma mu. So up, up at the top there, wave function and and self energies um, just goes over to gamma mu. So those guys don't contribute anything. They just, they cancel. Um, but the other diagrams do. Okay, the other diagrams, you know, they have structure like the following. Let's, let's take C. The amplitude for C is, you know, there's some numbers out in front. It's integral d4k over 2 pi to the fourth minus i over k squared minus mw squared minus i over k squared for the gluon. So those are those propagators. Then the upper line would be something like um, gamma mu 1 plus gamma 5. Uh, let's forget the external momentum. So it's k slash over k squared. This is, this is relative to the divergent part. And then over here, there'd be a uh, minus i g gamma lambda lambda a a over 2, right? That's the gluon line. That's the gluon vertex sitting there. And that would be sandwiched between external spinners on the top line. Okay. You get to the bottom line, it's sort of the same thing. It's minus i g gamma lambda lambda a over 2 k slash over k squared gamma mu 1 plus gamma 5. That's the upper bottom line. Okay. So you can see that at least the, the divergent part of this, so there, you know, there might be a p slash here, but the divergent part of this that's relevant is the most divergent part is when k and k are the same, so there's a k mu k nu, which is g mu nu over g mu nu over 4 times k squared for that, for that integral. There's then, so that's a k squared divided by, by k squared, k squared, k squared, k squared minus mw squared. So one of the k squareds disappears from the numerator. You've got k to the fourth and another k squared. So that, in fact, is finite if I keep mw, th this propagated it. If I were to throw that away, it's log divergent, right? Because it's k to the d4k over k to the fourth. So if I just keep that, it's log divergent. So this tells me, that just from that fact, you can tell that this is going to g have a log of, it's going to be a finite integral, but it's going to be log of mw squared divided by something. So this integral then, the integral that we're after, well, there's a, it's, it's the integral d4k over 2 pi to the fourth, 1 over k to the fourth, 1 over k squared minus mw squared. Okay. <coughs> this goes up to infinity, of course, at the upper end, all, all momentum. But now Wilson, here's, here's where effective field theory starts coming in. Wilson says, I'm going to only integrate out the gluons above some scale lambda. I'm not going to do the whole calculation because, in fact, you can't do the, the calculation at very low energies because low energy gluons are, are tough to deal with. So this only makes sense at high energy. So I'm going to do just the, the integration above some scale lambda. So here's Here's the separation scale. Or so what Wilson's going to do is integrate uh, all the high energy gluons, and then we'll deal with the rest later. OK. so. You, if you do that, it's, it's minus i over 16 pi squared, 1 over mw squared, log 
um, no, mw squared over lambda squared. Okay, so I mean you can get there, there's plus constants, but I'm not interested in the constants right now. But you can so you can get this law just by looking at it. You know, it's, it's, again, does everyone get that argument there that if I if I took away that k squared and just took this as 1 over mw squared, that it's log divergent. So therefore, I know that since it's finite, that it has to go like 1 over mw squared log mw squared. Is that obvious, everybody? That's, that's, no, it's not. All right. Um, all right so let's I don't know how to explain it other, other, other than that, it's, but, but it's one of these things that, that you, you sort of know. So it, it, this guy would be log lambda, lambda being the upper curve. So it's sort of like, uh, it's sort of like putting in Pauli Villars regulator, right? Except that it, instead of lambda, the Pauli Villars, you have MW there, okay? So it was log divergent, so this is the regulator for it, so it turns into log MW. Yes. Right. Yeah. Just looking at it, that's right. So, you know, what I do is, 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 is you say, can I set MW equal to zero? You know, but I mean, not M zero, to take it heavy. Can I neglect this propagator here? That's the typical thing you want to do. And the answer is no, you can't neglect it because then the, the diagram diverges where it should be finite. It diverges log logarithmically. But it should be finite, so you know that that it's sort of like taking MW to infinity makes it log divergent, so it should go like log MW. That's that's the logic. Okay. Um, does everyone believe that now at this stage? If not, you can just do the bloody thing. Okay. Um, so we get a, 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 a log mw there over lambda. The only other scale in the problem is lambda, so it always comes with over lambda. That's, that's also obvious. The, the Dirac factors that sit there can all get reduced down to a single Dirac matrix. And I don't know if I've given you this identity before, but here we have gamma lambda gamma sigma, gamma mu, one, well, I don't, for the identity, I don't need the one plus gamma five, okay? So there's three gamma matrices there. We know that the, the basis states of gamma matrices include, you know, one, gamma five, gamma mu, gamma mu, gamma five, and sigma mu nu. We, since there's three of them there, that always has to go down to one of them. So it's either gamma mu or gamma mu gamma five. And you can do that by putting these one plus gamma fives on the various sides there. And, uh, you, I, I can show you that if you want. But if not, I'll just give you the identity. This is G lambda sigma gamma mu plus uh, G sigma mu gamma, gamma lambda minus G mu lambda gamma sigma minus i epsilon mu nu alpha beta, no, no, mu nu, I forget that, mu, lambda sigma mu nu gamma nu gamma five. Okay, so that's an identity. Have you ever seen that before? I have seen it. Isn't it kind of easy to see though? I mean, it's basically just take all different permutations of Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I mean that's how you can derive it. You can you can take various traces there. You you, you can show that it has to have. Uh, so I mean, one thing you can do is 
put another gamma matrix here and take the traces, then you then you get all these terms here. That, that, that's just, that's that's using that other identity. Okay. Um, maybe it should be obvious. It's 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 true. <laughs> right. Right. And you know the the way you remember where the minus sign goes. The minus sign goes when when these sit on the outside. Right, you have to flip one through the other, and then you get a minus sign. Anyway, so these all go down, t and when this gamma 5 here, since there's a 1 plus gamma 5, just turns back into a gamma mu 2, so all these things work out. So that the, the end result is a second operator, O2, which is d bar gamma mu, 1 plus gamma 5. Now it's lambda A u, u bar gamma mu, gamma mu 1 plus gamma 5 lambda A, lambda A times D. So it's basically the same operator except with color matrices in there. Okay. But that's a different operator. So it's, it's O2. So after doing this, the then to at, at then including this guy, we end up there's actually one more or that's relevant, which I'll say in a moment, but we have G Fermi over to the two V V. There's the first one hasn't really been modified, so it's still O one of zero. And then it becomes minus 3g squared over 6, or over 32, when you do all the, the, the diagrams. Pi squared log mw squared over lambda squared, O2. Okay, and there'll be one, there'll be one more that I'll mention, but it's not that relevant for us here. So here we're starting to see the operator product expansion. You know, C1 is still is still 1. C2 is equal to that guy. It's a function of mw over lambda. Et cetera. I think the, the for me, the, the thing I want to talk about is the interpretation. So we've integrated out high energy gluons. with energies greater than some scale lambda. This is a very Wilsonian thing to do. To s you separate it to high and low, you integrate out the high stuff, but you still got the low stuff to do. This has led to, this leads to a, a, an effect of Lagrangian. Here it's a pitch traditionally written as a Hamiltonian, but it's the same thing. Where the coefficients depend on that scale. This is now to be used as a full field theory. And so you, have n you then, when using this, you include gluons up to the scale lambda. Now, in QCD's case, that's that's not an easy thing to do because it's non-perturbative. So you might, for example, t do a, a lattice, and a lattice o automatically has a cutoff. It has a cutoff one over the lattice spacing. If you make that of order lambda, then there are no gluons on the lattice that with scales higher than lambda. So you then uh, have included all the ones up to lambda. So if this is done correctly in the perturbative regime, so lambda is big enough, you can do perturbation theory, this then should, should be independent of what that scale is as long as it's a high scale. But this is the, the, the separation of uh, the, 
that goes into many Wilson ideas in which we think of. Now, in practice, th there is, a, again, some, uh, some issue of people tend to calculate these Wilson coefficients in dimensional regularization. Lattice has a real cutoff. So lattice actually has to, to, to do this right. Lattice has to, to, to do a real cutoff and then transition it into dimensional regularization. So there's a lot of interesting theory associated with that that's buried in the lattice literature. But you may see a lattice talk guy trying to do it, trying to do the, the matching between a dimensional regularization calculation on one hand, which is the high energy stuff, and a cutoff regularization, which is the lattice. Okay. That's non-trivial. Okay, so this is a very, this is Wilson, Wilsonian effect. Let me just finish up the, the rest of the story quickly. The rest of the story is a, something for a different day, but okay. There are other operators. There's there's another one that looks like this. It's um. A gluon S to D. W with a gluon going there. That's also the operator d bar d slash one plus gamma five f, and so you drop it. Okay. There's one that's like this s d free gluon. That's, that's actually like Bill Marciano's talk yesterday. The, the part of that goes into the D slash here, right? That's, remember I said, there's a D, that's a covariant derivative. So one of this is D bar gamma A slash S, where A is the gluon field, okay? So there's part of it is in there. But there's another part, which is the magnetic moment part, the, like the calculation of magnetic moments that we did. So there's another operator, which is d bar um, sigma mu nu. Let's put the s over here because I have to say something first. F mu nu, there's a lambda a here, and there's an a there. Okay, so that's, that's an operator. That that operator, okay, sigma mu nu connects left to right. Okay, it's not left to left. You know, gamma mu connects left to left. One connects left to right. Sigma connects left to right. Okay, so this you would think this might vanish because this is a left-handed S core. S quark and a left-handed um, D quark. The answer is that it, it doesn't vanish. It it because if you calculate it with the, the masses in there, it gets proportional to a mass. So this turns into MF, and this is then one minus gamma five here. Okay, MF being much bigger than MD, we use that one. If, if this was the bottom quark, you'd use the bottom quark. You'd use the heavier one. Okay. So you flip the chirality, and you have a mass star. I don't know if I, how obvious that is either. Do you, are you comfortable with it? This is, this is why the electroweak corrections in the muons that Bill was talking about yesterday, um, the, the G factor went like the muon mass squared because it's defined with a 1 over 2 m mu, it, the electroweak effect goes like m mu. So you probably don't remember the comment, but I remember thinking that this is the reason why. OK, so there's, there's that operator. And it's there. It's, there's no reason not to include it, except that it's relatively small. D 
dimensionally it, it this gets it's ms over mw actually i'm not i'm not so sure that but anyhow it, it's, it's relatively small it's all relatively unimportant but then the one that's that that is there is if i take a glue on here s d w uh quark quark okay. well you'd say that's almost like the one above so it should be small but it's, it's actually not true there's there's a piece here in the upper vertex here that goes like gamma mu one plus gamma five times q squared if you calculate that that's the charge radius it vanishes on shell so it doesn't contribute to anything else but then there's a one over q squared from here so they cancel and there ends up being a, uh, a net operator that, that's a nice local operator so the operator is um, d bar gamma mu one plus gamma five s q bar gamma mu and there should be a, a color factor lambda a there lambda a there q okay. this is the so-called penguin diagram it's actually easy to calculate I can give you uh, I uh, it's another I can give you a homework problem with doing it yes Okay, so there's a bunch of funny stories associated with this. The the real reason it's it's called the penguin diagram is that um, John Ellis, who's a theorist at CERN, his girlfriend bet him that he, he couldn't get the word penguin into the physics literature. <laughs> okay, so he took it up as a challenge, and so he wrote this this diagram. And let's see if I can do a good job on it. Um, so let's do this. Like this, so I have to distort it a little bit. <laughs> you can make it sort of look like a penguin, right? I don't know if that's the best penguin that you can do with. That's uh, that. That is the story. It, it has nothing to do with penguins. It, <laughs> he, it was a bet. He did it. He 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 produced some picture. And he, and he put a little eyes there, and a smile, and, you, and you've got it. Um, and, and it worked and people liked the story enough <coughs> he wasn't even the first to calculate it the, so it, it's a special feat if, if, he, if he was the first to calculate it he say he might get naming rights um, but it was actually I was the first to calculate it it's, <laughs> uh, and yet another uh, another funny story associated with it this I, I was doing this uh, operator project expansion for this thing as a grad student and well, it was it was done by Lee Gayard, uh, Ben Lee and Mary Gayard, and I came across this diagram. I calculated it's not zero, um, and I didn't know what to make of it because it, it wasn't in the Gayard Lee paper. So Barry and I were going to a conference where Ben Lee was speaking. So we we took it along. We showed Ben Lee this. We said, you know, what do you what do you make of this? You know, what what should we do with it? He says, ah, that that doesn't contribute to anything because if you use mass independent regularization, it vanishes. Okay, so and the answer actually is true. If you understand what it means, is that there's a, uh, the gym cancellation. There's an up quark and a charm quark and a, and a top quark there, and if you set all their masses to zero, they all cancel. Okay, it's by the, it's a gym mechanism. Um, and but Barry and I said, well, if the master says that, I guess it must not do anything. I mean, I, I calculated it. it's not zero, but he says it, it it must be zero by mass independent regularization. Okay, so I went back. You know, I was a grad student at the time, and the next year, Schiffman, Weinstein, and Zakharov published it. Published the calculation. It makes a big splash, and um, it be becomes a, a big part of the story of weak interactions. So the, the the lesson is is don't trust the experts. <laughs> um, 
But then, you know, it's, it's, it's only fair to point out that, that Barry and I didn't know what to do with it, and Schiffman, Weinstein, Zecker have not only calculated it, which is trivial, it's a, it's a calculation I can have you guys do, um, but they, um, they uh, knew what to do with it better than we did. So they, they said why it was important. One of the reasons it's important in present day stuff is that CP violation sits here. Uh, because because it sums over up charm and top the CKM elements in there have CP violation in there. <laughs> They're penguin paper. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's a long it's a long time ago. It's, this is back when I was a grad student, and you can tell that this is <laughs> it's a while ago. <laughs> Well, it, it's a famous paper. I mean, I, it's it's one of these. Fu it's a funny one in that it it hit the Western world through a preprint, and one of these these little funny little ITEP booklets that are preprints, um, and it got published in a Russian journal. But the preprint got cited a lot. I mean, if you want, if you want to see it, I can probably find the reference to it. I, we used to have to cite it a lot. Now it's not. No, no, it's it's a it's a famous paper, uh, but no, I, d I don't have any pain. It's, uh, uh, it's just I, g I get a good story out of it, you know. <laughs> that's, that's enough. Um, you know, if, if it was the only thing I did in my career, I guess I'd be more be more <laughs> more bothered by it. But you know, it's okay. I I didn't know what to make of it. I didn't have have a good interpretation. They 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 did point out. In addition to calculate, they pointed out why it's important. One one of the reasons why it's important is that there's there's right-handed quarks down here too, and there's an enhancement in the matrix element that comes from that. That's which I didn't know about at the time. Um, and they didn't know about CP violation, so it became more famous after CP violation because it's where CP violation lives. And but at that time they they weren't even concerned about that because it was still in pre-CP days, or pre-top quark days. Anyway, all right. Just to complete the rest of the story, the, the, the technology also wouldn't stop here, would use the renormalization group. Um, and so everyone who does these re things, the renormalization group, it, these things turn into the coefficients, which are functions of MW and lambda turn into things after you do the renormalization group of alpha strong at lambda divided by alpha strong at MW raised to some power. And so there's a big technology of which is way moved past the the simple calculus. The simple ones you can anyone can do. The other ones you have to be a member of Boros's group because he he's made his career out of doing these things over and over and over again in different contexts. Okay, so if you want to do it over and over again, you can join his group. Okay, so that's my end of my OPE. Anyone have questions that you want to ask about it? Just uh, we'll come back to it a bit when we do the weak interactions because this is, this has been relevant for that. Yes. So let me just see if I understand everything. Yeah. Basically, we just started from Lagrangian, right? And then we just wrote out the diagrams we wanted, right? And then we calculated them, right? And then the parts that were left over with their operator, right? That's right. So we match. We we say, here's here's the effect. What's the operator that leads to that effect? Okay. So, in the case of the diagram that we did up here, you know, changes color by with a lambda matrix. It has the gamma u one plus gamma five, so it looks like that. So you just that, that's what you do. Yes. You just match matrix elements. With the, this operator has the same matrix as the original Lagrangian. So that, that, that's so it's again it's a form of matching. So what we have in our Lagrangian though we have like uh, two quark terms, four quark terms, yes. six quark terms, right. so on, etc. That's right. 
Right, and so the, the effect of Lagrangian could write all these guys out too. So the, you know, it would ha it would have this 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 operator in it, for example. So last topic I want to do is not so much a, a effective field theory, but I want to do it here anyhow. It's the background field method. And it needs to be done somewhere. This is as good a place as any. And I'm, I, I don't know for sure whether we're going to use it in this matching calculation that we're doing or not. I, I guarantee you that if you were doing it with the masses of the pions not being zero, that would be the only way to do it. Okay. The, we're doing it with zero pion mass, which makes it a lot easier because there are certain diagrams that will vanish. Those diagrams are just are very painful to do. So, so it's a technique that I've used yeah, maybe only twice in my career to do a real calculation. But there's something pretty about it anyhow. So let's do it here. Maybe we'll use it. Maybe we won't. So here's the, the, the logic. Okay, normally we, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use lambda phi to the fourth as my example. Okay, and I'll, I'll do the, it there and then I'll do it in the chiral theory also. Um, so normally we write out lots of diagrams. You know, we write out that diagram, we write out this diagram, this, this diagram, et cetera. You know, plus other. And if you have a more complicated theory, there's, there's lots of interesting diagrams that you can write out. Um, and to do this, what you first do is you write out all the, all the vertices. And then you, you take, so you've got the Feynman rules, you take two of the fields in the vertices and make two of them into a loop. And you have the other guys sit, act on the external states. Okay. Well, the background field method basically reverses the order of doing this. In the background field method, what you do first is you identify the, the particles that go into the loops. The, so we'll, we'll call these the quantum fields. That go into, in, into the loop. Okay. We then do the loop. The other fields are just carried along as background fields. So this, so here, and that's where it comes from. The name comes from background. Okay. So the loops end up being a function of these background fields, which are just sitting there. After doing the loops, you then um, then you let the, the fields act on external states. Okay. So it's actually a more direct way to get to some of these effective Lagrangians. Okay. Just, just, so what we end up doing is you, you say phi is phi bar background is the background plus the phi quantum. Okay, so there's the phi quantum. We do the path integral over phi quantum, and that ends up leaving a, f a functional that's a functional of phi background. So it's like an effective Lagrangian of, of Phi's, and now these phi's act only on external states, and you don't do loops again. Okay, so these 
these guys then act on the external state. Okay. So, what's, what are a couple of advantages? Well, one advantage is that you can directly form your effect, one loop effect of Lagrangian. We'll see when we do the chiral case, we can, we'll be able to show that doing the loops leaves a Lagrangian in the exact same form as the original Lagrangian. Uh, the other thing that you can do sometimes, and th there's the reason for thinking about doing it here, is that if you've got a lot of co complicated things in your diagrams going on, you can this separation here is, is relatively easy. You just ex you just expand it up to two f factors of the quantum field because you're just doing one loop, so it only has two things at maximum in it. And so, if you've got a lot of external legs there, uh, you, that gets all that calculation gets saved till till you re remove those two. So you've got two less particles to deal with. I, I'll show you what what I mean by that later on, but it's it's a simplification, and that's why we'd be interested in it. Okay. So let's do it for the 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 um, lambda phi to the fourth. Lambda phi to the fourth is too simple to bother doing this in most cases. The occasionally even that gets done there, but. But it's not it's not really needed there. So here we're, we're starting the Lagrangian is d mu phi squared minus m squared phi squared minus lambda over four phi to the fourth. Okay. We're going to let phi equals phi bar plus phi quantum. The Lagrangian then will have the form, well, the, if we expand this, it becomes the Lagrangian, the, the same Lagrangian as the function of phi bar. The linear piece is, so there's some linear piece, delta phi, on the, the phi quantum. The function of phi bar it turns into its box plus m squared phi bar plus lambda phi bar cubed. Okay, so I've just expanded, kept the first term, and it's true. On this guy, I integrated by parts. There's a d mu phi bar, d mu phi quantum. I took the derivative off that, put it on here. Okay. There's a reason for that. And then the next piece is plus one half d mu phi quantum squared minus m squared phi quantum squared minus three lambda phi bar squared phi quantum squared. So that's, that's the second order, and then there's higher orders, which we end up, don't contribute. Okay, so that's the experiment. Okay. At this stage, this linear term goes to zero by the equations of motion. If you assume that phi bar satisfies the equations of motion, then that vanishes. Because the first variation is the equations of motion, right? You know, how, what you do is you let phi, phi bar plus delta phi. <coughs> the linear term in delta phi is the equations of motion. So this always, always vanishes by the equations of motion. So there is no linear term. So the Lagrangian is quadratic. So we can write this as the Lagrangian of phi bar plus phi quantum 
is it, let's, let's write it minus a half, just in usual form, some differential operator by quantum. Okay, D in this case here, we just calculated, is box plus m squared um, minus plus yeah, it's actually it's plus six lambda five bar squared. Okay, the just to be let's put the brackets out there then. Okay, the half only multiplied the the, the kinetic energy pieces. We're just getting my factors of two right. Okay, so that's that's the differential operator. Now I want to do the path integral. Okay, the path integral over phi is the same as the path integral over phi quantum, right? Because I just change variables. I use so I do the path integral. I do, and I get, you know, so I use integral d phi is the same as the integral d phi quantum, okay, and, and now I get, a, 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 you know, z is the n times the uh, determinant of d to the minus a half e to the i integral d for x l of phi bar. We have to play with that the usual ways. This is is then e um, so let's just e to the i integral d for x, skipping a step, it's L effective, L of phi bar minus the x minus a half log trace log d. Okay. There's actually no, no re re remaining trace left over because the only coordinate here is, is x, so we just, that's the trace there. Okay, so that's the thing we have to, we, we get it after doing the path integral. Then we play some of our, our path integral games. So let's do the heat kernel, for example. The heat kernel turns this into n e to the i integral d four x. It's L of phi bar. Then there's a um, plus one half i actually the i's been factored out. It's over four pi to the d over two m over m m to the d minus 2m, gamma of n minus d over 2, the coefficient, heat kernel coefficient, right? That's, that's, uh, we, we did that. Um, a0 is 1, so that's just a constant. A2 in our notation was minus sigma. Not A1 was minus sigma, A2 was minus one half sigma squared. Okay. The notation we used before, this guy is sigma. And so we end up here with then then we end up with integral d four x L of phi bar and it turns into, it's minus m squared over 32 pi squared uh, 
gamma of 1 minus d over 2 times 3 lambda phi bar squared minus uh, 6 lambda minus 1 over 32 pi squared gamma of 2 minus d over 2 phi bar to the fourth times six lambda squared, dot, 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 okay? So what do we got here? Well, we actually have terms now that look like the, the original Lagrangian. So here's, here's the uh, a Lagrangian now that has a term. This is mass renormalization. This is this is, goes into the renormalized lambda phi to the fourth. And so instead of doing all those, all those complicated diagrams the way we very first did it, in, in basically one line, you know, I've taken my time in doing it, but if I was doing this myself, I would have just written this out. We've got an explicit renormalization of this where we have the operators that look just like the original operators in the, in the Lagrangian. So one of the beauties of it is that you end up with an effect of Lagrangian with the real field sitting there. And then you, and so you, this, this lets us do the renormalization and with explicit five fields. Okay. So we just, this, We've renormalized this, and, and we're we're set to go now. Okay. Let's let me try to do one more thing. Let's do this. Okay. But anyone have questions about that? I'm gonna. Uh, I, I clearly won't get to it this time, but I'm gonna do this for the sigma model next time, so we can get the renormalization explicitly. for our sigma model calculation. Okay. The, other, the, the other way of doing, uh, evaluating that is in perturbation theory. Okay. The, basically, if I let this d, which is called d0 plus sigma, d0 is box plus um, m squared, then if I, I want to evaluate log d, that's log d0, 1 plus d0 minus 1 sigma is, okay, is log d0 plus log one minus one plus d zero minus one sigma. This guy we throw away, and so then the the uh, Lagrangian then has terms in it that look like I'm going to expand this. Is you know, it starts off as d zero minus one sigma, and then there's a uh, half plus a half d0 minus 1 sigma d0 minus 1 sigma plus dot dot dot. The, this guy then, the Lagrangian is d4x. Now, the first term here is the d0 minus 1 is the Feynman propagator of x. It comes back to the point x because sigma is evaluated at x. So if I'm taking the x matrix on this, it's x on this side, it's x on this side, sigma is at x, so it's that. And the, the second term is plus a half, um, let me leave a space, df of x minus y, sigma at y, df of y minus x, 
sigma of x. So I start at x, end at x, go anywhere in between, d4x, y, d4y now, plus dot, dot, dot. Okay. So what we, we recovered by this is the old pictures. This plus this plus this, etc. So the first term here, sigma was phi squared, remember? Phi squared then acting on external states gives this with that propagator. Here sigma is again phi squared. I act on the external states with phi squared. These are functions. I act on the external states here with phi squared. And I reproduce all these diagrams. Okay. So, so we, we now take matrix elements. And you and you reproduce the, the usual perturbative series. Okay. So I've done this background field method now. So we we, we did the loop before taking matrix elements in both cases. The we did it two different ways. I did the 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 heat kernel and I did perturbation theory. So these two ways, the heat kernel is it's good for the renormalization co coefficients. It's bad for the finite parts. Okay, so you can you can do the renormalization really easily using the heat kernel, but you can't do a complete calculation. For example, you can't get the, well, there's in this guy right there, there's an imaginary part. It doesn't show up in the heat kernel. It just isn't, isn't visible at all. The perturbative way that I just showed you, it's not so good for the renormalization. So renormalization has to be done still process by process. In other words, you can't do it all at once like you could in the heat kernel. But but you reproduce you know, perturbation very easily. Okay. So the, the using the heat kernel it would have been a nice way to, if we had this in our toolkit to do renormalization way back at the start. You, it's easy to see that the terms that come out look like the terms in the Lagrangian, so you just renormalize them. And so advanced people tend to do that if you want to show that some, how to renormalize the theory. They use background field plus heat kernel. If you have to want to do a real calculation, you can't do that. You have to do this perturbative method. And But there, there's sometimes where it's worth doing. Okay. And I'll talk a little bit more because I'll show you where it would be worth, it might be worth doing in our calculation. And we'll see whether or not whether or not it's it's worth it or not when we get there. I, I don't know yet. I mean I as I say I've done it a couple of times, but but not too often. Okay? Good. So let's stop there. We'll see you next time. Okay. Well what I want to finish up last little bit is this on the effective field theory. It isn't really effective field theory, it's the background field renormalization. But I'm doing it for the effective field theory right now. So let's uh, let's um, do that. What I'd like to do is, is the, the background field renormalization of the sigma model. Okay. So. What I have here is what we did last time when we did the background field method. Let's scroll back up and remind you, we, we expand around this background field in the quantum field. We do the loops, the path integral over the quantum field. You're left over with an effective Lagrangian that has the 
just the background field in it. In the case of the scalar field theory, this gave us the renormalization of the mass renormalization and the phi of the fourth renormalization all at once. And that, that's the same thing that we'll see when we do the sigma models. So, in the sigma model, we start off with a Lagrangian. The basic Lagrangian is, is v squared over 4 trace d mu u, d mu u dagger. And the field u was e to the i tau uh, pi over v. Okay, so there's, there's the problem that we're dealing with. And so what we'd like to do is break this up into background fields and quantum fields. And there are various ways to do this. They all lead to the same answer, fortunately. It's, it's another version of this Hogg theorem. So for example, we could do the following. Here's the one I'm going to do. I take u, I write it as some background u bar, and e to the i delta, where delta will be really tau dot delta a, and we can get a normalization if we want, but that's, that's the, it's the, the divergent pieces aren't, don't depend on the normalization. Um, this has the, this is good. It has the advantage that it maintains u dagger u is equal to 1, which you have to maintain. But there are other ways. You could have done, you could have done e to the i delta prime u bar, where the quantum fluctuation sits on the other side. Or you could have done a another a symmetric one, um, c e to the i eta c, where c times c is u. So c is the square root of u. Um, if you go in the literature, Gasser and Leutwiele use that one. Our book uses this one. They you can compare the answers we get to the same answers. So it's, it's, it's actually, you can check it. So, so let me use that guy. Okay. And so then the, the procedure is you just take this Lagrangian and you expand it. L is, well, it's the first order term is L of u bar always. The second order term, if you work it out, minus 2i trace um, u bar dagger give you u. No, actually, I'm just using regular derivatives here, d mu delta. And then the, the last term is the quadratic pieces um, trace d mu delta d mu delta plus u bar dagger d mu u bar is delta d mu delta minus d mu delta delta. Okay. Uh, actually, the order makes a difference since these are matrices. Okay. The first term, if I integrate by parts, this is the equations of motion. Uh, we've never worked these out, but it, That's 
that's the equations of motion. So that that vanishes as it always does. Linear terms always vanish. And then the, the next term is there. Okay. Our our goal in doing this is then we want to write this in the form well, uh, the trace of this guy, the second term there, or the, the third term, is 2 delta A from operator DAB delta B. Okay. If we can do that, then we know how to do the path integral over quadratic operator and we're done. Um, DAB is going to have the form, is going to have the form d mu, d mu AB plus sigma AB with this canonical form d mu AB. It's a matrix. is delta AB derivative some gamma. Okay. And it's pretty easy to see what gamma is. You know, if I, we do have to do a little, these are matrices here. So you have to get, you have to deal with the matrices. But there's, remember this, this thing is linear in the tau matrices. I don't know if you remember me saying that. We, we worked out the first two terms now. That's linear in the tau matrices. There's a tau matrix there, tau matrix there. So you've got three tau matrices. You just do that in collect terms. But here's the term with with one derivative on delta and, and something else. So that's that's one of the terms in D. In D. So gamma is just just related. Just calculate this term here, and you get get we got gamma. Um, the the first term is is here, and then sigma gets uh, the the gamma squared and the sigma sort of compensate each other. Okay, when I take this, I get a gamma squared piece. There is no no term like that up here, so sigma compensates for that. So it's basically just putting it into that form. Let me just tell you what the answer is. Gamma. A B is minus a quarter trace it's tau A tau B U bar now your D mu U and sigma A B is I have one eighth Trace. It says tau a u dagger d mu u. Those are u bars. Tau b commutator. Okay, so it's just basically some terms like that. Everyone clear on what we're doing here and also on the why we're doing it? Okay. At this stage, you can do the path integral. The path integral is the, then the integral d delta e to the i integral d 4x Uh, actually, there's an F squared over 2 delta A D delta B. You then look, go to your, your famous heat kernel dictionary. This turns into minus I over 2 2 pi, 4 pi to the d over 2. That's 
e to the IW, and this is IW. You know, D4X, um, gamma of 2 minus D over 2, trace 1 twelfth gamma mu nu, gamma mu nu, plus 1 half sigma squared. Okay, so you probably recognize those terms from what you, the homework you did. Um, this, there's no mass in this. These guys are massless, so the the terms that, that were linear in the mass drop out. There is not, no term like that. Um, this is the this is the trace over x. This th there's still a residual trace over the rest of this stuff. When you take either I trace log, you trace over everything here. So here you trace over the other stuff too. Those terms, these guys are just simply formed from derivatives of uh, gamma and sigma is up there. You work it all out. It says that, that W is the integral d4x minus 1 over 192 pi squared, 2 over d minus 4. All the uh, associated constants. And then it comes out as 1 half trace D mu u bar, D, D mu u bar dagger squared plus trace of um, D mu u bar, D mu u bar dagger trace. That's right. One of these is new. D mu u bar d nu u bar dagger okay so we we explicitly get back the effect of lagrangian okay so the it's easy to see that the we renormalize the parameters that I called alpha 1 and alpha 2. You can do them all at once. The other thing that's really, really easy to see here is that all reactions have the same renormalization. That's actually a big step. You know, if you what, what we didn't know from our previous example, you know, we did a particular example, pi pi scattering to that one loop. But you don't know that if you did, if you went off to some process with six pi ions or eight pi ions involved, that after collecting all the diagrams, you get exactly the same divergences. This is the proof that you do, because you would now apply this by expanding this and doing four pi ions. 6 pi ions, 8 pi ions, et cetera. And so all of the um, reactions get renormalized in exactly the same way. So it's a pretty big step. Questions about it? The, whether we use it in in our calculation. I'm, I'm still not sure. I know if we were doing it with a massive theory, we would. Because here's the diagram that would drive me bananas. If I do this, this guy here, these are all pi ions. Pi, 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 pi. That's an extremely painful diagram to do the normal way. 
Because you, what you do is you expand it to order phi to the six, which that's painful by itself. You have to take the trace with six six tau matrices. So you have to figure out how to do that well. And then you have to contract all possible combinations. Okay. So you search out all ones and you contract all the ones that, that are the same. And so that's rather painful. Uh, and that's one if I were to, I might be tempted to do. Fortunately, I know how to do the calculation very trivially here, and you probably do too. For us, it equals zero. So we've done the calculation real easily because this, there's no mass in this, in this loop here, and so all those loops with no momentum flowing through them and no mass, they all end up disappearing in dimensional regularization. So that's not so, so clear that we, we don't need to do it for that. This guy, it could also be a little painful, and that's the one I don't know if we're going to do. Again, this one you only have to expand to four, and you have to do various combinations. I think that's probably doable. The one we will use, at least in spirit, we'll use renormalizations for um, this, this guy, where this is an F, because it's really easy to do that diagram. <coughs> you don't have to do all the expansions there at the start. You just, you note that this is S squared trace D mu U D mu U dagger. You just call this thing X, there's no momentum involved, and you calculate X. And then after you do the loop, you, you expand. So. That one will do, but that's pretty trivial. That's, uh, uh, the question is whether we do the, the ones that go like this. Um, pi, pi, s, s, pi, pi, which turns into x, x. And I, I don't know, if, I still don't know. I'll have to try doing, doing this and see how painful it is. Okay, but I, I have used this technique in, in both the gravity calculation and in the um, in the case of uh, chiral perturbations here a couple of times. Actually, I shouldn't have closed that. I should ask for questions first. Anyone want to ask a question on that? I can always pull it back up. Yes. Okay. Yes. So the background field method. So we're basically we expand it as something like the classical solution plus the quantum fluctuation. Right. Exactly. And then the since the external states satisfy the classical equations of motion, they they satisfy the usual just the linear classical equations of motion. You then can expand after you do the loop. You then expand the background field in terms of external states. That's the procedure. You know, you, you 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 do the quantum parts before you do the external states, and it has a certain economy, as you can see from that example there, where you renormalize everything all at once. Okay. Basically, just doing all the loop calculations. You're doing the loops first, exactly, and then you, so you end up with a an effective action that's valid at one loop, and then you just take tree levels on that. It's another one of these techniques that, that is, can be useful at times that you often don't find in these books. But people use it. Yes? The, the S loop, um, let's pull it back up, sorry. What, this one right here? Yes. Um, okay, yes, 
this is true both here and here, is that if you do momentum conservation as you go through here, the, the momentum that flows in here flows out there. There's no net momentum there. So it's just, this is just the integral d4k with one propagator, d4k over k squared. So in this guy, you take integral d4k, 1 over k squared. That's, of course, looks badly divergent, but it's one of these, these infinities that gets set equal to 0 in dimensional regularization because there's no scale for it to, to be equal to. Okay, so, so if I put it minus m squared, this goes like m squared, so it vanishes as m squared goes to 0. Okay. In this case here, this one is also true. This one doesn't vanish. This one has the m squared in it, so it's a divergent constant. It just is, it just is a, a strictly divergent constant that goes into the renormalization of this operator. Okay, so the what, what we call v squared gets renormalized by that guy. But I'm not sure. So, but it's just a constant. It's a pretty easy diagram to do. Okay. Anything else before we move on? <laughs>